The case that we are treating today at Hospital Clinico San Carlos is a very interesting case. It's a 71-year-old gentleman with a history of uh, diabetes mellitus type 2. Uh, he actually presented recently, um, several days ago, with an episode of chest pain at rest. He was seen by the emergency uh, team and he was found at that particular point not to have, say, significant changes, but subsequently he uh, developed some mild ST and transient ST changes uh, in anteroceptal leads. And this lead was followed by a rise in troponine uh, I uh, levels, which of course uh, ring the bell that something might be happening uh, serious over there. Now there was um, some delay between that and treatment. The patient had had an allergic reaction to some of the medication that he was uh, giving on board and he had stabilized uh, subsequently. So what we are, um, we performed a coronary angiogram that revealed that the patient has some diffuse disease in the proximal LAD, evidence of calcification in this vessel. Uh, and there is a suspicion that probably what you have there is much more atheroma than you think, perhaps involving even the ostium of the left anterior descending. So part of the um, strategy that we have today with this patient is first to outline whether these narrowings that we see in the left anterior descending do have a hemodynamic uh, impact consequence. Second, to understand if that is the case, where this chemodynamic um, effect is more relevant or more pronounced. And third, planned uh, eventual intervention based on the characteristics of the substrate, of the plaque, the landing zones for the stent, and also to understand in case of there is a proximal LAD or, or austere LAD stenosis, if we have to extend the treatment up to the left main. So here we have the angiogram at the time that we are uh, about to perform physiological interrogation. As you know, with IFR we have a perfect matching of both uh, pressures before starting the measurement. And here what we have done is crossing the stenosis with the pressure guide wire and we are performing a pullback while we are recording. We are paying attention, of course, to the modification in the IFR ratio that is expressed as the blue line. And at this point we can see that there has been a brisk change that continues uh, over a long segment of the vessel in terms of um, IFR values. Now, uh, by performing core registration, what we bring is to incorporate this information to the angiogram so we can now understand and select the segment of the vessel that accounts for most of the hemodynamic severity. Subsequently, what we need is to obtain some structural information about the vessel, and this is something that is obtained with IBUS. In this particular case, the calcification that we can see here as a ring of calcium precludes the advancement of the probe to the distal part of the vessel, but we can still get a valuable information of the proximal part that is will be used subsequently to determine the landing zones, and more importantly, the dimensions of the stent that we want to use to treat this patient and to normalize uh, the hemodynamic um, impairment. So basically it's a combination of first uh, understanding the physiology of the vessel uh, longitudinally and then to understand the structure of the vessel. As we can see here, um, you will have made a big misjudgment if you judge the size of the vessel just from the lumen. You can see that the vessel, actually, the structure of the lumen is about four millimeters, while the lumen is barely two millimeters in, in, in diameter, as average. Uh, and that is extremely important because if you are choosing a stent that is going to go up to the left main and that uh, you will be aiming to land the stent according to the dimensions of the lumen, that's the reason because now we are measuring the lumen in the left main, you will see that you you can actually implant a stent that can be expanded up to four millimeters in the left main in a vessel that, as we said, at the point of a minimum, minimal luminal diameter had a, a vessel diameter of around four millimeters. So this information, of course, is very important because understanding that you have adequate vessel remodeling, it is uh, important from a safety perspective in terms of choosing a stent that can be accommodated, that can be expanded without leading to a problem like a vessel rupture. 
Now, uh, there is room, of course, to use also quantitative angiography and other uh, imaging guided techniques. Here you are seeing how, in this particular point, we are using enhanced um, visualization of the high-pressure balloon that we are using here, the non-compliant balloons. We can see that with this non-compliant balloon, uh, we have actually gone to very high uh, pressure and we have um, um, expanded completely the balloon, which ensures that we are performing adequate uh, plaque preparation. Something that, of course, is going to be of great importance to ensure that the stent uh, is properly expanded at the time of implantation in this very calcified uh, vessel. You can see that we have protected uh, side branches now with uh, the stents, and based on the information that we had, we are choosing a 28 millimeter stent. We know that we have to go to 4 millimeters diameter in the left main, uh, but we judge that the best uh, diameter in the landing, distal landing zone, will be 3 millimeters. So we choose a 28 millimeter by 3 millimeter stent to be expanded later uh, with a high pressure balloon in the left main. And again, uh, what you are seeing here are the different stages where we are using also visualization of the silhouette of the stent using uh, enhanced uh, stent imaging technique to ensure that we are performing a proximal uh, optimization therapy pot with a larger stent, in this case it's a 4 millimeter uh, non-compliant balloon to high pressure. Now, what of course is extremely important once that you have implanted the stent is to ensure with intraconal imaging in this complex scenario that you have obtained uh, adequate luminal diameters. And in this case you can see how beautifully the, spen the stent has been expanded in this uh, calcified stenosis. Um, we can also estimate if a position has been uh, adequate by using techniques that enhance uh, flow areas inside the lumen. This is the Basically, what we are doing now, um, areas that have um, flow are coded in red color. So if there are areas of the stent that are malaposed, you could see that there is red color behind that. Of course, you have to understand that in some situations, what you may have are um, side branches, like in this particular case, where you will see flow going to the side branch. Uh, but um, in terms of optimizing the stents in the left main, it's a very a powerful tool to help you to ensure that you have full stent apposition. Now, this is the final uh, result uh, of the uh, implantation. Well, I think that the case that uh, we just performed is a typical example of uh, diffuse coronary artery disease. And um, we are going to review some of the most uh, interesting aspects of the intervention. I think that obviously we should start with the characteristics of the vessel. If you look to the diameter that this vessel has here, it's very small. Look at the guiding catheter, that is seven French guiding catheter. You will understand that the vessels that you have here are much thinner than you will expect in a patient uh, that is a male uh, with normal dimensions, 71 year. Uh, you will expect that the left anterior descending here should have a lumen of around three millimeters. And as you can see, the vessel looks much thinner here. So the natural tendency when you use um, angiography to eyeball the dimensions of, of your stents is uh, to go to a smaller diameters. But there is even a much more important problem. Which segment of this vessel is accounting for hemodynamic severity? Where would you place your stents in this diffusely diseased vessel? And this is, of course, the first thing that you have to outline in diffuse coronary artery disease to understand uh, which segment you have to address in order to improve coronary hemodynamics. Well, this is a good illustration of how coronary physiology, in this case uh, IFR co-registration with angiography, is giving us the answer to the problem that we just uh, described. So we know that in the distal part of this vessel, the, there is a problem. We have an IFR value that is very low, 0.89. So that means that at this location here, we have an IFR value that is very abnormal. Now, each of these dots account for a drop in IFR of 0 0.01 units. And basically what that is telling us is that we can actually improve the hemodynamics if we treat 
up to t here, we can really improve that. But remember, we are seeing a vessel that is diffusely diseased. So if we embark in treating this particular aspect, we probably will have to find adequate landing zones to really remove as much as possible of this hemodynamic impairment. And this is the question that, again, physiology cannot give you an answer. Uh, you need now the concourse of imaging. And imaging will be extremely useful now that you have the physiological information in trying to understand where to land with your stent and how to achieve the best, the largest possible dimension of your stent and your lumen to improve and to, fast, to, to, to make your long-term outcome as soon as possible. Now, one of the problems you may find sometimes with IVOS uh, in vessels with diffuse disease and calcification is that actually it may be very difficult to negotiate your IVOS to get pre-PCI images. And actually, this is what happened with this particular case. We were able to reach only this level of interrogation to the vessel. From here onwards, this segment could be interrogated, but nothing else. Yet, we obtained a lot of very uh, useful information. One of them, of course, as expected, is that you will have a lot of calcific tissue, nearly a, ring, uh, a napkin ring location of calcium in this particular vessel. Second aspect that is very important is that you have compensatory vessel remodeling. Look to the difference between the lumen of the vessel that you have here and the true size of the vessel. The true size of the vessel is about um, uh, four millimeters in diameter, that, as you can see here. And this obviously uh, speaks that you can really choose a much bigger stand than uh, you would probably take if you are using eyeballing of angiography to treat this particular segment. So in other words, up to here, we know that probably we can place a stent that will be nearly of the similar diameter of the left main. Um, and the question is now to understand where we should land it properly. Again, this case exemplifies that we have many tools in the CAT labs that are extremely useful. And one of them, and very easy to use nowadays, is quantitative coronary angiography. Uh, as you can see here, what we did is we make some measurements in the distal part uh, and of although you could correct this particular part because there is some actually you could introduce some small uh, correction due to this side branch we could see that actually this landing part of the vessel will have a luminal size of about three millimeters in diameter which fits very well with the measurements that we make with IVOS. So merging the information that we had from QCA in this particular case plus physiology plus IVOS we came to the conclusion that the stent that we have to use in this particular uh, case will be a, around a 28 millimeter stent and that the dimension that we should use should be 3 millimeter diameter in the landing zone and that in the left main, we should go to four millimeter by the diameter. And with this, we planned uh, our intervention. We knew on the top of that, that we have to perform a very aggressive uh, treatment of the plaque to prepare it. And we decided to try first with a non-compliant balloon and to dilate with uh, high pressure. So in summary, this was a real life case uh, of complex coronary artery disease in a patient with diffuse coronary artery disease uh, in whom a number of decisions were made based on different uh, techniques, physiology, intracoronary imaging, co-registration of imaging and physiology with angiography, quantitative coronary angiography. As you could see, the information that we were obtaining at each uh, stage of the procedure was providing more solid grounds for making subsequent uh, decisions. I think that this is one of the great um, advantages of uh, accessing and using these technologies. And actually, it would be very difficult to demonstrate, based purely on trials, the amount of information and uh, safety that gives to the interventionist at the time of performing and making decisions in coronary interventions. Innovation and you, Philips.